I'm Frank Daly and welcome to That Sounds Interesting podcast, which features interviews, short stories and discussions on unusual topics, but relevant in the current world. I first met Jason Jarrell in Berlin at a Shut Up and Write meeting about uh, three or four years ago, and um, he was hosting this meeting a couple of times a week. And I found out at that stage that he was uh, working in quite an unusual area. It was the development of tabletop role playing games. Now, it's an area I know very little about, and hopefully my knowledge will be expanded a lot by Jason's interview. So welcome today, Jason, uh, to my podcast. I'm delighted to have you here. Well, thank you, Frank. I'm uh, delighted to be here. And hopefully I can I can share some interesting stuff with you. Yeah, well, from, from the occasional conversations we had when I was in Berlin, it was always very interesting. And I thought, well, look, it'd be, it'd be very interesting to learn a lot more. So maybe we could start with just a little bit of background, Jason, uh, a little background on how you got involved in the business. Um, I um, came... Uh, well, I have been playing uh, tabletop role-playing games since I was uh, probably 10 or 12 years old. My mother first got me a copy of uh, one of the early Dungeons & Dragons boxed sets from the for a Christmas from a Christmas catalog. And um, I initially tried uh, disastrously to to run it. Um, it was very abstract and strange, and we couldn't wrap our heads around it, my family. Um, but then, uh, the bug was still there and then we ended up moving to a, uh, neighborhood in a different town. And I noticed one day that the kids across the street were playing a game out on their front, uh, the sort of rock garden with little tiny miniatures. And I went out and asked what they were doing. And they said, oh, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons and we're using our garden as a, a dungeon, like an outdoor environment. And I thought, that is awesome. And uh, they let me play. And then from then on, I, I was pretty much uh, a lifelong hobbyist. Okay, and it's great to have expanded that from being something that you were passionate about as a kid and all through your life to actually being able to work in the area. Yeah, it's it's a really kind of one of those uh, hard to believe things. I mean, an industry that like the notion, you know, as a kid, that this would be my full time job and that I would actually be a uh, um, successful at it is baffling. But great, actually, nevertheless, many people would be jealous of such a having such a job, as, you know, doing something that you lo- love every day. So um, just a, just before we get into a, a little bit more detail, uh, Jason, um, the concept of tabletop uh, role playing games is it may not be familiar to many people who might be listening to this uh, podcast. So maybe you can just explain that. Okay. Um, well, uh, the whole real, the industry as it um, exists was sort of born out of um, miniatures wargaming, um, where basically, you know, I think most people are familiar with wargaming where you've got these giant armies of little um, figures. And I mean, those go back all the way to... Uh, you know, military strategic uh, simulations and maneuvers, um, you know, hundreds of years. H.G. Wells wrote a book about um, miniature wargaming, you know, so it's got a, uh, a, a very distinguished pedigree. And in the, um, I think it was like around the early 70s or so, some of the um, creative minds, some of the earliest people in the industry started thinking about um, rather than just having these sort of faceless little army figures, they were sort of giving them personalities and names attached to them. And rather than focusing on an entire army, they started focusing on a little group of characters. And then before too long, this sort of, the, you know, the army became a squad, basically. And then before too long, they thought, well, you know, we're doing these sort of... Um, you know, things with like Arthurian knights and wouldn't it be fun to have a priest there, you know, and maybe the priest could heal people and maybe there would be a wizard there. And so suddenly all these other types started emerging and they started having, 
you know, magical abilities like the priest can heal an injured knight or um, the wizard can fire a fireball across, you know, and blow up an enemy from a distance. And so then, um, uh, ironically, some of the, uh, the, you know, you had this idea of these little miniature figures that had um, personalities attached to them, and they still played in the sort of uh, tabletop wargaming mode, although the full large-scale wars became skirmishes with little groups. And then, you know, there's a, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but there was a package of these weird little dinosaurs that appeared, it was published by some sort of a Japanese uh, toy company, and they were distributed all over the United States. They were these cheap little strange plastic uh, monsters that almost seemed like the kind of things that would show up in a Godzilla movie. And um, people, they were perfect in scale for these little miniature figures that are about, you know, 25 millimeters high. And so the idea of characters, you know, these little people fighting monsters became known. And some of these weird figures that didn't even have names, they developed these identities in tabletop role-playing games, you know, like things like the Rust Monster and whatnot. And uh, as a result, they sort of codified these. And then eventually the, um, uh, some of the earliest games started being published in this very primitive format, you know, these sort of stapled booklets sold in plastic bags. Um, and then that eventually became the early rules for uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which was sort of the forerunner of the, uh, I think Chainmail was one of the earliest that was a little more uh, about the skirmishy character stuff. But Dungeons and Dragons was the first that sort of suggested a world that the characters and the players and a game master would collectively describe and play. And so rather than just thinking about your little, your little miniature on the table, you sort of took on a persona and you um, evolved them through gameplay. You know, the law, the more games you played, the more experience you got, the better your character got in terms of their skills and abilities. So um, it it developed actually quite uh, quite dramatically then from those early days. I mean, I guess the concept of having a world, a kind of defined world, and then having different adventures within that world uh, developed over time. Right. And um, the earliest models, and honestly, um, probably I would say most of the um, uh, the defining paradigm is still you know, for many cases, this idea that there is a tabletop, there are little miniatures, like most of the time when you see people playing Dungeons and Dragons in a movie or a TV show, they'll have a tabletop with little figures because that's very visual. It shows, you know, it, it's, it's a very strong visual image to say what they're doing. But most games now are played almost entirely just described through conversation and, um, And without, you know, sometimes there might be a map on a table, but miniatures are becoming increasingly less uh, relevant to most gameplay. Okay, so a lot of it is to do with imagination and your imagination makes those characters. But I mean, there's many books that that are uh, the rule books and the books that describe the stories. I mean, you've written many of those yourself, um, um, which which give the whole background and and how um, games are actually played. So I guess there is a visual element of it as well as just the description. Right, right. And there's a lot of, you know, I mean, the books tend to use a lot of art. They use maps, um, some types of games, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them uh, at this point. Some are gigantic, some are very, um, what they call indie, like little, very niche games that maybe only a few hundred players or people know about even. But um you know, they they range from these huge, well-described worlds with um, years and years of accumulated uh, backstory and um, source book material that's been published to the point where you can, you know, say like, oh, this is what the people of this particular town look like and act like. And these are here's a menu from the pub that the characters might, you know, visit and enjoy to ones where... Um, the game master, you know, who's sort of the ringleader, the the host of the game, lays down a blank sheet of paper 
and says, let's draw the map, everyone, and everybody puts something on the map that they think should be there, and they name them, and then they sort of develop the, the world collaboratively without any... Um, that's a great idea. That's a super idea, uh, uh, Jason. You know, like a complete roll your own game uh, uh, from whatever the imaginations of the people at the time. Though I guess the thing is that you're probably guaranteed more satisfaction in terms of games that have been developed and have been tested. To each their own. I mean, I find that, um, you know, sometimes when a world is too developed, you know, there's an idea, that, a fear that you have to, like, memorize everything about the world before you can play in that world um, versus ones where you're making it up as you go. There's a, a feeling of um, real uh, collaboration. And for, like, a group of highly creative people, they might enjoy or prefer a game where everyone has an equal say in what gets created and developed, whereas other people might be like, you know, I don't. I don't want to come up with the information. I want somebody else to do that for me. And so I think there's room for all kinds of games. Of course, of course, actually. And I guess it's different groups. And actually, that brings me on to a question is, who exactly plays these games? Um, a lot of people. I mean, the the interesting thing is a lot of the, uh, the rise of computer games and computer role-playing games have... Um, has sort of, it, it stemmed out of uh, tabletop RPGs with some of the earliest games like Ultima and um, even Mushes, you know, and multi-user uh, dungeons, MUDs and Mushes and whatnot, where people were doing chat-based games on early internet exchanges. Um, those inevitably were adaptations of, or, you know, very similar things to early Dungeons and Dragons and games like that. And then, um, you know, they became increasingly sophisticated to the point where you have things like World of Warcraft and, you know, these incredibly ambitious, gigantic games that are cultural phenomenons. And um, many of those also tend to feed back into legitimizing the, the tabletop industry because people find that, you um, you know, when you're playing an MMO or online game, you're sort of limited in what you can do. And you're also, you know, sitting at home for the most part, looking at a screen, maybe you've got a headset on and you're chatting with people in your guild. And I think that that um, sort of makes people feel, uh, you know, they're, they're interested in doing a, a more human step. And so um, I would say also just a, a side thing that happened was these movies called The Lord of the Rings. Um, and, you know, you can say that um, the whole, this massive uh, uh, Hollywood input of the Lord of the Rings films, the Star Wars films, the um, Marvel superhero movies, these are all sort of uh, feeding this uh, wish fulfillment, um, escape to another world, have adventures uh, feeling. And so um, I think all of those sort of work together and uh, are ending up uh, driving more and more people into tabletop role playing game. And, and you can, there are people who have been playing tabletop games since the early days uh, in the 70s and there are people who have just discovered it you know since the pandemic began and who are playing their first their first experience with uh, tabletop rpgs is over zoom and that's again again a different experience a tabletop game been played online effectively because of of requirements uh, you know social distancing and you know on on a, the inability to be able to travel, I guess. But, I mean, it's quite a sociable activity, I guess, uh, when it is played around the table. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a uh, it's a wonderful pastime. I mean, it's despite the fact that you need a table, it's uh, pretty portable. I mean, anyone with a table or even a couch with uh, a room with plenty of chairs can play a tabletop RPG. Um, you can play at a beer garden and... Um, I have done so quite recently. Um, when I was in high school and junior high, um, we played at a local restaurant owned by one of the players. And then we later moved to playing in the basement of the town library. And so, um, and in a, a unused classroom in my high school. And so, uh, you know, you, I've seen games that have been, I mean, I've been on trains where people are playing games with uh, facing seats and a table between them. So there's all kinds of opportunities for 
playing games, and there are even a few that are made for uh, people who are hiking. There's a game that literally just uses hand signs and uh, whatnot to determine random events, and uh, you can like play as you hike. Well, okay, really interesting idea. It's getting involved in right into the game itself. So um, what about the gameplay itself? How is it set up and how do they you move through the game and how you know and then how do you actually finish up eventually? Okay, well, and again, there's so many different varieties of this. Uh, it's the field went from very straightforward, like the earliest days you sort of you had a game master. They had a map. The map was a dungeon. There were a series of rooms. It was a very linear experience. You would go into the dungeon. You would go room to room, have a, a, an encounter of some sort, usually with a monster. Sometimes it could be resolved through combat. Sometimes there was a riddle game or, you know, there was some sort of environmental obstacle, like a trap you had to... Uh, figure out how to do and to to resolve that you used dice usually your characters had certain ratings to determine how strong or fast or um, skilled they were could they climb walls could they disarm traps could they shoot magic bolts from their hands could they heal people you know all of these were sort of quantified in very rigid uh, uh, numbers and everything was very carefully described and as things got wider and sort of evolved beyond the dungeon, you found that like social abilities came into play. Characters would, um, you know, like your ability to role play through encounters um, became increasingly important. And as uh, games evolved beyond just uh, sort of these fantasy games, you know, they, there were science fiction games, action adventure games, historical games, Western superhero games, humor games where you, you know, you played cartoon characters. There have been a lot of licensed games based on almost any film or television franchise you can think of, um, like hundreds and hundreds of those throughout the years, uh, and they're increasingly dominant in the uh, industry. But, um, you know, it, it's usually boiled down to dice or um, some mechanic that involves a random element. And then um, in the past 20 or so years, there have even been a number of games where you simply um, you resolve things through role playing or um, there's just a sort of conflict based negotiation or you've got a pool of tokens you can spend to succeed or fail or whatnot. Okay, so um, just on that point, are the players working? Are the players working against each other? Or are they working together in a collaborative way, or does it vary from game to game? In most cases, you're working together. I would say that up at easily ninety-five percent of games assume that the group of players are working together towards a shared goal. Now they may have rivalries with each other, and they may. Um, you know, uh, compete against one another in character, but it's um, it's a very different mechanic from like playing a uh, a board game or a war game where everyone is out to win basically for themselves. In role playing games, it's it's like not a zero sum game. It's more the game master is presenting a challenging environment and the characters that inhabit that environment, whether they be monsters or enemies or allies or um, whatnot, and the players are all trying to negotiate that environment and uh, uh, succeed in it and survive. And so uh, what's the, uh, the the concept then of um, character uh, character roles? Um, well, generally you have a situation where every player... Um, he plays a character. They've defined their character using some rules and they know what they can do and what they can't do. How, like I said, how strong or smart or charismatic they are and whatnot. And all of these are basically given some values, usually numbers, um, sometimes adjectives or whatnot. And then, um, uh, Generally, when a player speaks, they can, they're can they either speaking in character, they say like, you know, I demand a drink from the bartender, you know, or they, um, uh, they speak in a very uh, sort of a meta fashion where they say, oh, my character goes up to the bar and orders a drink. Um, so, uh, and, or you could even have like fully immersive where you say bartender, 
a drink. Your best. <laughs> I would say that, that, that I'd say that it could be very funny then, actually, if everybody addressed those roles and got completely into character. Oh, it's it's actually a lot of fun. I, I mean, that has led to uh, what they call a live action role playing where people are actually wearing costumes and completely immerse themselves into this experience. They usually play these in outdoor areas or larger uh, things. But um you know, there's some level between there, whatever people are comfortable with. They uh, they say generally you handle a lot of combat mechanics in that sort of abstract way. Um, but, um, you know, that's how you do that. But the game master, uh, they handle all of the other characters. And they usually basically are sort of a one person improv crew that handles everyone else in the world. They, they describe the actions and the personalities and the appearance and uh, the dialogue of every other entity that the player characters encounter. Okay, okay. So he's so the game master is kind of filling in those um, non-player characters uh, at the right time, I guess, because he's very knowledgeable of of what what the uh, how the game should play. So how long does the game last? Um, uh, games. Well, I noticed that on, uh, you know, video and whatnot, um, they tend to be a bit shorter because, uh, playing a game on zoom can be a little more grueling because you're constantly focused. Um, but frequently tabletop games run anywhere between like three and six hours. Um, a standard is four, um, but some people spend longer, sometimes less. And are they all done in one session or would there ever be a case where you have a, a session uh, which is a, a particularly long game and you have a session for a few hours and then you come back and, and continue it on? That's the standard, actually. Most They call those campaigns uh, or just long, long adventures or sessions or scenarios where like or investigations or missions, depending on what the genre is. You know, in those that you can have you can have what they call a one shot where everything was resolved in one play session. You can have a, a longer, a, you know, a longer game where you have multiple sessions, but it's still the same story. And then you can have campaigns, which is an ongoing and, uh, you know, serialized uh, set of adventures, you know, like you might, it might be the equivalent of a one shot being a, a movie, uh, you know, a session being like a, tr or a, a short adventure being like a movie trilogy where you get like three adventures, make up an epic thing. And then a campaign is more like a long standing TV series where you have recurring characters and a narrative that happens between every uh, session. Okay. Okay. So then obviously a group of people who are playing that have been played many, have played many games together if they're involved in a campaign. I know maybe you could have characters coming in and out uh, in, in that scenario. It's usually how it happens. You know, people think, oh, I have a friend who wants to play. Sure. Or, oh, you know, somebody is moving. Bye. And so uh, you end up with a lot of, uh, or just if somebody can't make a particular session, then you play on without them. You know, you turn them into a non-player character for that session. Of course. And so um, I know you mentioned this uh, earlier on, but what about now with the restrictions, you know, because of COVID-19 and uh, people having to turn to use it, playing some of it online? How, what's it, what's the play like? You know, what are the games like in, 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 in those scenarios? Well, I mean, it's been, you know, kind of interesting seeing how things have developed. I've heard from, uh, friends who actually like some some friends in austin texas discovered that their next door neighbors one day they looked out on their deck in front and they looked across the just to the house next door and they noticed that their neighbors had a table set up and were playing dungeons and dragons outside and they thought well we play dungeons and dragons and they play dungeons and dragons we can have a game where we're socially distanced and so they just literally pushed their tables up to the edges of their decks where they were only about, you know, three or four meters apart and played across this gap, you know, two households not meet, you know, they're meeting, but they're not meeting. Other Such a people, brilliant idea. Yeah, there are virtual tabletops that are very sophisticated um, where you basically create the almost the tabletop environment of maps and little miniatures and figures that move around with dramatic lighting and, 
soundtracks and online dice rollers. And then I would say most people use just uh, things like Zoom or Google Hangouts or other uh, methods of just, you know, video chatting with each other. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll use a chat thread if you want to send secret messages or um, whatnot, or you'll, you know, have a Slack thread or a Discord thread parallel where you might share documents and things like that. That brings me on to uh, one of my final questions, Jason, and it's like, can you recommend some books or websites or videos where people, how people can get involved in, in actually uh, role playing games? Well, there are um, plenty of plenty of sites. I mean, if you want to go full bore with the um, uh, like tabletop gaming simulation, there's Roll20 and um, a few other things like that that are uh, full on simulations. There are a lot of Google and or not Google, uh, Facebook groups and meetup groups that do tabletop gaming in your area, even though that's increasingly not uh, relevant anymore. Now, if you can find people who are in a relative time zone to you, you can, um, or at least a time zone that's convenient for you, you can play with people all over the world, which is, you know, the case that uh, I find myself doing now. I'm, you know, running games with people in multiple countries and, sometimes seven or eight hours time displaced from me. It's a strange, actually, it kind of a, something good that came out of the restrictions that you suddenly were able to expand the game playing across the world. Right, yes. And also since I think uh, online games um, traditionally, I mean, most people I find have a much shorter attention span for them, you know, because they can, there's what, what they call Zoom fatigue. So, um, you know, uh, I find that it's easier to play a lot more often because uh, you don't have all of the hassle of, you know, getting up, going across town, sitting down, buying some snacks for your friends and you, and then sitting there and being uh, blocking like a four to six hour block of time to play a game in. Um, like now it's, you know, a lot more casual, like, oh, well, we'll play a game for three hours on a Sunday afternoon and I won't have to leave my living room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was so, so in very interesting uh, types of development. So Jason, um, uh, that's been a super introduction to to um, this uh, topic. And I have to say, I've learned a lot, a lot of th questions that I never asked you when I was in Berlin. So it's been very, very interesting. So um, thanks very much for being on this um, uh, podcast. And, um, you know, I know you because you work in the industry as well. Perhaps we might do another podcast uh, interview at some stage about the business of developing those games. But for now, I've learned a huge amount about it, the topic, a huge amount about it, and thanks very much. Okay, yeah. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to having a follow-up conversation about the, the whole behind-the-scenes, how the sausage is made um, part of the uh, equation. Okay, th thanks a lot, Jason. See you then. Okay, take care. That's it for this episode. See you soon on the next episode where there'll be a new guest and a new topic. Mm -hmm.